So I was asked to talk to you about NATO's northern flank. So we're going to look, start here looking at the geography. Now, uh, you might think this should be one of the simpler lectures, but actually um, the, the institutions are very complicated. The organizational uh, competition here for this region is very complicated on the Western side. And then I'm gonna show you some events, particularly on the Russian side that make this uh, militarily and diplomatically very complicated too. So uh, that's just a preview that this is um, a more complex subject than you would think the Northern flank. Um, now the Northern flank, uh, this, this slide is gonna give you the best over, overall uh, appreciation of what we mean by the Northern flank. Essentially, it's the Scandinavian countries, normally excluding Denmark. So we're talking about Norway, Sweden, Finland, and that includes Greenland, whose foreign policy, military policy is handled by Denmark still, although Greenland is an independent state. Uh, its foreign policy, military policy is still handled by the tiny state of Denmark, which doesn't have any mountains and isn't connected with the other Scandinavian countries, but is certainly part of the Scandinavian group. And then Iceland, formerly Danish, but is an independent state. And then Britain is counted uh, as part of the northern flank. It, it takes a lot of leadership on the northern flank. So those are the, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, if we count them all as independent, independent states, that's seven countries. Those are the core countries of the northern flank. And then the core seas, are the North Sea, which is, I'm gonna to try to show you my mouse here. So my North Sea is this sea between Britain, Norway, Denmark, northern coast of Germany, the Netherlands, the North Sea, North Sea, and then the Arctic Sea up here, and then uh, to the Russian coastline right here. And this creates some interesting bottlenecks in naval terms. So we'll start on the outer. This is called the GIUK gap. And it's the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom gap. So there are these two gaps actually, but it's for some reason it's uh, termed in the singular. So you've got two gaps between Greenland and Iceland, between Iceland and UK. And during the Cold War, Britain led NATO's defense of these gaps. The idea was that that NATO did not want Soviet naval forces getting through these gaps and operating in the Atlantic Sea with attack submarines, knocking out surface vessels and perhaps even nuclear uh, ballistic missile submarines. Um, so this was a key defensive point for NATO and still is for the, for the simple reason the geography hasn't changed. So this is the outer uh, defense line in naval terms for from, from NATO side, for the West side, because it's not just about NATO as I'll explain in a moment. This is the, this is the West's defensive line. And then the bare, the bare gap is Russians, Russia's defensive line. So this is the key gap that Russia is defending from incursion. However, this sea is international waters. So NATO is now engaged in essentially freedom of navigation missions into this area um, and also espionage uh, signals, intercepts and all that sort of stuff. So this, this, these seas should remind you a lot of what we discussed uh, last time we met a few weeks ago um, in terms of the seas off China. So it has the same issues, there's bottlenecks, there's trade to defend, um, there are um, freedom of navigation missions and there's potential for accidental triggers of hostile acts, so uh, accidental collisions, accidental misinterpretations of um, spying on each other as hostile acts. Uh, there's potential, there's a lot of potential triggers for war in these seas at any day. I'm not talking about some future escalation there could be some um, provocation that could happen tomorrow in these seas, and I should mention the air spaces too. And then because the, these seas are surrounded by those seven countries I mentioned, 
on the western side and then Russia uh, on the other side, essentially, eight countries, the, their coastlines um, are also at issue. And when I say at, at issue, I'm not even talking hypothetically. These coastlines are penetrated by Russian special operations forces, submarines. Submarines have been, as I'll show you, sub, uh, uh, unmanned submarines and manned submarines have been spotted inside the territorial waters of Norway, Sweden, um, Greenland, Iceland, and then you've got aerial incursions. So Russian aircraft will test the uh, national airspaces of these countries. So the, the, for, for these countries, these boundaries feel like a, uh, like the Cold War. It's Cold War II. You've got those maritime and, and aerial in, incursions into national airspaces. National airspaces, I'm not talking about international waters national airspaces by, by Russian aircraft, Russian um, ships, and at times Russian ground port personnel, special operations personnel, landed on these coastlines by small uh, submarines to do who knows what. And I haven't even finished the geography because we, we're gonna talk about the Baltic seas here because the Northern flank used to be just about these seas, Arctic, North Sea, and preventing stuff getting into the Atlantic Sea over here. But Russia's got more active in the Baltic Sea and the same countries that care about this coastline on the, uh, bordering the Arctic and North Seas, they have to care about the Baltic Seas because Russian naval vessels are coming through the Baltic Seas around Denmark into the North Sea. So there are two routes by which Russian surface and, and submarine vessels get into the, the seas at issue here. As I told you, it's complicated. It, it's going to get more complex. So let's, uh, let's have a look at um, some other parameters here. I haven't even mentioned ballistic missiles yet. So it's, the concern from the Western side is not just uh, naval vessels, aircraft, uh, incursions from Russia, it's ballistic missiles, which you can't defend against particularly well. There are ballistic missile defense systems that are actually not um, well deployed in this region for various reasons, primarily because the biggest country here at risk or exposed, let's, let's say that uh, let the correct verb here is exposed, the most exposed country geographically is Sweden, and that is technically neutral. It's not part of NATO, although it does militarily cooperate with NATO and with some other organizations that I'll show you. Finland is also technically neutral, neutral in a similar way, neutral but cooperating with uh, various organizations. Um, these short range ballistic missiles, which is this uh, solid line here, they cover Finland and a bit of Sweden. The medium range ballistic missiles essentially cover the whole of Scandinavia. Um, they don't go as far as Britain, but the, this is the key coastline. If you want to have anti-ship missiles deployed, this is the coastline they're gonna have to be deployed on. And this is, I haven't mentioned this yet. This coastline is extremely difficult to defend. It's, it's it, there's so many islands and inlets and it's not, uh, it's not particularly residential, it's very far north, it's, it's within the Arctic Circle. There aren't many civilians around to help you spot landings and ma malicious activities going on. So it, this coastline, it, it's, it's tricky. It's really tricky to operate in. Anyway, bear in mind the ballistic missiles, that's another um, platform. Looks a bit complicate, complex, but let me explain what's going on here. Here are the countries at issue, European, also um, the United States, so North American countries, the United States, Canada, mostly European countries. Here's the, the countries, they're placed in these various organizational memberships. And then these are the, <coughs> excuse me, these are the organizations boxed around the countries that they contain. So you've got um, some obvious organizations I don't need to explain much. Here is NATO which is a large organization, but 
not all of the countries at issue here are in NATO. I mentioned Sweden and Finland, they're technically neutral, nominally neutral, practically not neutral, but nominally neutral. They are not part of NATO, although they do cooperate with NATO. So those are the two key countries, not in NATO. Um, and then you've got the European Union, which is not a defense organization, but it has defense and security cooperation initiatives, including a funny one called PESCO, which is permanently structured cooperation. It's an ongoing initiative, it's in development, um, and it's sort of a competitor to NATO. It's going to, it's planned as the European Union's military arm, um, although there's some uncertainty about whether it will be achieved. It's, it's already achieving things like armaments, cooperative armaments acquisitions and things like that. But whether it will actually create a force, European Un Union force, that's, that's another question. But anyway, PESCO exists, but it's a long-term development. Um, right, let, let me see if I can get some animations here. Uh, yeah, that's okay. They're not quite coming through the, the way they should do. Um, but let's, so let's start with, with NORDEFCO, which is the Nordic Defense Cooperation Initiative. Um, dates to 2009, but it merges programs that date back to the 1960s. It has a historically, um, historical focus on peace operations, training and acquisitions cooperation, but now it's more focused on countering Russia. Uh, NORDEFCO is not part of NATO or anything else. It's primarily these five countries, the, those Scandinavian countries here. They're, uh, they're, they, have, um, they have signed a memorandum of understanding which allows them to cooperate easier on various activities, but there's no permanent structured command system, multinational command system. One of those countries would have to take the national leadership of the multinational uh, activity, whatever that is, and none of those activities are permanent. Um, it just creates a, a new, uh, uh, not a new institution, but an alternative institution for these Scandinavian countries to do things outside of NATO, European Union, other organizational initiatives. So that's NORDEFCO. Then you've got the Northern Group, and this is the most important of these groups. It's the largest uh, of the groups that covers the Northern flank. It's uh, mostly NATO members. So here's, here's the box. It includes the Nordefco countries, also Britain, um, the Baltic states, which I'm going to show you is essentially four countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and pretty much Germany, because <clears throat> Germany almost has a coastline, which is Baltic, and the Netherlands, which has a North Sea coastline. The Northern Gram is essentially a defense forum. There's no command structure. There's no, no permanent activities. Uh, defense ministers come together every so often to plan uh, cooperative military exercises and other initiatives. The military exercises that are the most profound practical activities that the Northern Group helps to organize. Although in fact, um, practically speaking, those exercises are really NATO exercises, but Northern, the Northern Group helps to bring in countries like Sweden and Finland into these exercises under NATO auspices, Sweden and Finland can say they're cooperating with the Northern Group, not with NATO. You know, you can you can imagine the the utility in being able to organize this through the Northern Group when you're a neutral country. So that's the Northern Group. It's the biggest of the groups that are shown on this schematic. Now, the next one down is the JEF, which is the Joint Expeditionary Force. Dates back to 2012, it was the UK national force, but in 2014, at the NATO Cardiff summit, Britain, the British government proposed that it becomes multinational, so other NATO countries could choose to opt in to this joint expeditionary force. And why 2014? This was a direct response to 
Russia's invasion of parts of Ukraine. And NATO as a whole decided it was going to do various things to deter Russia, and this is one of them. So the Joint Expeditionary Force is now a multinational force, but it is led by the United Kingdom. It has um, uh, most of the Scandinavian countries doesn't have Iceland, but Iceland actually doesn't have much of a military to speak of anyway. Um, and then it has the Baltic states apart from Poland. And it has the Netherlands because the Netherlands is very engaged in North Sea security. Maritime and amphibious capabilities in the Netherlands happen to be very strong, even though it's a very small country. So that's the JEF. Then you've got um, the EI2, sometimes mis, uh, miswritten as E2I, but it's really EI2. So it's a European intervention initiative launched by France, leveraging the existing military liaisons to France with the objective of enhancing multinational uh, cooperative activities in service of any other organization, even outside of an organization, any organization, uh, any of these organizations. So you could have a coalition which is actually not affiliated with any organization. Um, e I too would help to liaise that sort of mission. Um, right. Then finally, you've got Visegrad, which is only four countries. Uh, initially, it was a cultural exchange. So we're talking about Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia. Initially, a cultural exchange program, pretty much diplomatic as well. And then in 2011, it agreed to form a European battle group to serve the European Union, as well as the NATO Rapid Reaction Force at the same time. And there are actually quite a few EU battle groups that have this dual role. Like all the battle groups that Britain is involved in have a dual role, as in they can serve NATO. Some of the EU battle groups are, are not assigned. Like the, the ones the French are involved in are not uh, uh, assigned to NATO. It's complicated, right? There's diplomatic, <clears throat> uh, um, what's the right word? There are diplomatic um, constraints on what countries can commit to because their own neutrality or their own, like take France, it has a peculiar relationship with NATO where it's not integrated in NATO, but it's part of the NAT part, the treaty part. So it's a member of the treaty, it's, it's in treated to NATO, but it's not part of the integrated command organization. Uh, so these, you, so that's the reason why you have various organizations here which achieve different things in the same geography, depending on who's neutral, who can get in, right? You get the picture. Okay, let's get to some events. Uh, Right, so this the 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 current Cold War II really starts in 2014. Um, Russia had been ex escalating some activities before then. The West wasn't necessarily catching up with those until Russia invaded parts of Ukraine in 2014. 2014 was a was a year when Russia was already being aggressive uh, in. Western air spaces and maritime spaces, even before it went into the Ukraine. So it's doing a lot more of the old Cold War um, aerial intrusions into national air spaces. And there were some submarine intrusions, like Sweden um, provided evidence uh, from Sonar that there was a, a unidentified Russian submarine, which they then later identified from some from some debris was Russian. So there were, that was in Swedish waters and allegedly landing special operations for, forces on Swedish soil. So 2014 was um, a landmark year. So NATO, to its credit, reacts re quite strongly. You get the sum, NATO summit in Cardiff. Uh, where, that's the one I mentioned earlier where um, uh, the UK offered its joint expeditionary force to multinational membership. The same 
summit, NATO as a, as a whole agrees to rotate forces into the Baltic states, which they eventually define as these four states, Poland through Estonia. And there's land forces, we're not gonna dwell on those. We're gonna focus on the naval part of this. Now in 2016, NATO's European commander, European command has nothing to do with the EU, despite how this acronym looks. This is NATO's European command, nothing to do with the EU. 2016, it warns that there's more Russian attack submarines. So these are not the small, tiny, tiny submarines that are landing special operations forces. These are big attack submarines, the ones that are designed to kill ballistic missile uh, submarines in the Atlantic. And they're operating more aggressively, 50% um, more so over the year 2015. This is what NATO says in 2016, uh, about 45 attack submarines. And NATO says, we've got to step up our maritime capacity to counter these sorts of submarines. That was in 2016. So the focus there is submarine, subsurface. However, there's a surface concern here. So Russian jets and actually surface vessels are buzzing NATO vessels on the surface of the Baltic Sea, in, in, intimidating them, interfering with their uh, operations in international waters. So this is not in Russian maritime space or airspace. This, these are international waters. And Russia is doing what I showed you a few weeks ago that China does in the South China Sea, particularly buzzing foreign vessels to, to intimidate and to interfere with their freedom of, freedom of navigation missions and even their fishing missions and stuff like that. So this goes on routinely, right? 2016 was a bad year, but now it's norm, that, that level of activity is normalized. So later in um, actually 2017, the Northern Group becomes more important. Northern Group becomes this forum where the, all of the neighboring countries to the Baltic Sea, the Arctic Sea, the North Sea, they choose the Northern Group as their primary forum because it's where they escape issues of uh, appearing to be too cooperative with NATO when they're not members or being uh, snubbing EU when they're cooperating with NATO or snubbing NATO when they're cooperating within the EU. If they cooperate in the Northern Group, they avoid these diplomatic tensions. So Northern Group becomes more important. The Northern Group starts being a forum where these countries agree mili joint military exercises, joint intelligence gathering, joint training. So Northern Group becomes more important in 2017 particularly. In 2018, you start to see more of what looks like the Cold, Cold War II. If you didn't believe me that we're, we're living in a Cold War II, maybe this, maybe this will put the icing on the cake. So 2018, uh, April, in April, uh, President Trump, he met the leaders of the Baltic states in the White House, all of them at the same time, and he was going to address their concerns about Russian incursions and particularly cyber attacks at that time. Now, coincident with this me meeting, Russia starts a live fire naval exercise in international waters. This, this is not in na uh, Russian national waters, it's in international waters, including Latvia's exclusive economic zone, which is sort of a national water, but not necessarily recognized by Russia. So it's firing missiles, uh, missile, anti-ship missiles into the sea in an area that Latvia considers uh, safe for international trade. So this is very intimidating. Um, and there's also some cyber attacks associated with that but you know Russia says these are private actors it's not Russian government but you know you you've seen the news you know what that's about um colonial pipeline and all that uh, just this month um and this is intimidated Latvia partially closes its airspace and actually it's it's some of its maritime trading uh, uh warnings it's warning against maritime trade also at this time. So this is economically damaging too. So this looks like sort of Cold War intimidation that you saw during the first Cold War. So how does NATO in particular respond? But remember that a lot of this is being organized through the Northern Group. 
um, it intensifies its military exercises in the Baltic Sea and the coasts of the Baltic Sea. So there's an annual military exercise, military exercise called Balt Ops, Baltic Operations. It's annual. And now it's organized by the Northern Group. It's led, commanded by NATO, but it includes non-NATO members from the Northern Group. So it's organized by the Northern Group. Um, and it's had a, it had a big exercise in 2019, landing amphibious forces off Poland and the Polish and German coasts, you know, mimicking if it had to land on the Russian coast or, or land in the Baltic states after they've been invaded by Russia, something like that. That's the sort of scenario they practice. Uh, and that didn't happen in 2020 because of COVID. So these, these exercises got canceled in 2020, it would have been even bigger in 2020. And it's not just uh, these naval amphibious exercises, you're having these sort of uh, Cold War intercepts going on a lot, it, particularly in Estonia, which is, which is most exposed to Russia. And the British Royal Air Force at that time was leading the defense of uh, Estonian airspace. So coincident with this exercise, Russian aircraft are incurred are entering Estonian airspace and they you know they want to spy they want to gather signals intercepts on the exercises they're spying on the exercises and other things and there were a lot of intercepts at that time <clears throat> right uh, let me check how I'm doing for uh, for time here right and so uh, I just got a few more minutes to tell you about the Arctic so what we've covered is is down here, right, here's the Baltic. That's what we were just looking at. Now, if you rotate the globe a bit, the Baltic looks really, really tiny next to the Arctic Ocean, which stretches all the way over here. And most of this coastline is Russian. Uh, most of this, these waters are international including the iced up North Pole, which is international. By international treaty, nobody's supposed to be permanently based there militarily. There's only a few scientific bases that are allowed permanently. However, Russia is expanding its military presence into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and uh, so 2015, it launches this new doctrine called, uh, it's maritime doctrine anyway, uh, with a target date of 2020. And it said that the Russia, Russian Navy's foci from now on would be the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic. Uh, and it was gonna actually base most of its Navy in the Arctic. And it was gonna have two new Arctic brigades. So these are ground forces that we're going to specialize in operating in the Arctic. So, you know, skis, airborne operations, amphibious operations. And it was going to expand air bases. And these, these red, yellow dots, these are all new bases that Russia um, confirmed it was going to establish or upgrade. And some radar stations too. This is, this is what Russia said explicitly in 2015. So in 2016, Norway, and that is to allow United States Marines to be stationed, permanently stationed in central Norway from 2017. Now, United States Marine Corps has always had a role on the northern flank, including with tanks, but obviously amphibious operations uh, and um, ski troops, like the like Britain, British ski troops um, and Royal Marines regularly exercise in Norway. That had always happened between before 2016, but none of them had been permanently based in Norway. Well, from 2017, US Marines have been permanently based. Just a note, the US Marines used to exercise their main battle tanks in, in Norway, but the Marine Corps in subsequent years, uh, actually 2020, announced that it was canceling its tanks. So it's, it's lost some of its capabilities to defend Norway, but um, it's focused, you know, there's, there's a longer, you can see the vi a video by me on my um, YouTube channel about that. It's focusing on Asia, uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, 
then right so that's 2017 that's the US commitment and then in 2018 UK uh, government uh, UK government had not actually uh, matched that commitment so that Royal Marines are not are not expanding their commitment to Norway and the UK Parliament's select committee on defense warned the government that it needs to increase its pres presence in the Arctic but that's 2018 you know there's all that um uncertainty about the about brexit the government almost falls and eventually it does fall in 2019 you get a change of prime minister so the government doesn't have the bandwidth to deal with that now in 2021 we're sort of post brexit the government is returning to these issues british government is returning to the issues and i, and I can tell you the the british government is serious about the threats up here it just needs to um actually executes them, executes actual uh, changes in activities. So that was Norway, Britain, United States through the Marine Corps. Then you get to Sweden. Remember, Sweden is neutral, but, uh, but it has a very strong, well-respected military. Its defense is, is good. It's, it's respected by Russia. Um, Sweden starts to re-garrison islands and bases that it has not garrisoned since the Cold War. That starts in 2016. 2017, it reintroduces conscription, which is a bit odd, uh, given after the Cold War, almost all the European states, you know, apart from Greece, Turkey, they all abandoned conscription. Sweden's, Sweden's gone back to conscription. It's that concerned. In 2020, October of last year, it legislates to raise defense spending by 40%, 40%. Uh, and, it, and explicitly it's aimed at Russia. Um, but on the other hand, there's just a, a caveat here that Swedish spending was not particularly high as a percentage of GDP. So it still won't pass 1.5% of GDP. And remember the NATO target is 2%. Sweden is not a member of NATO, so it doesn't have that target, but that's just a benchmark. Um, like Britain is beyond 2%. Other states are committed to go and beyond two two percent. You know, it's just it's a correlate. So there's there's a massive increase in spending, but from a low, a low, uh, a low level anyway in terms of GDP. Um, then um, then this is interesting. December of 2020, the Sweden Democrats, which is a is a it's a political party in Sweden. It U-turned on NATO membership, so it, it suddenly became pro-membership of NATO. Most Swedish parties historically have been against joining NATO. They've been pro-neutrality. Sweden Democrats, big party in a coalition government, they suddenly decided they're going to be pro-NATO membership, which gives a majority in parliament in favor of joining NATO for the first time ever. And that could happen you know, the, with the, the speed with which Sweden is trying to deter Russia, that could happen next year. Depends on how domestic politics go. That's an interesting thing to watch. Okay, I think this is the last thing I've got for you. Uh, 2020 was a year, because of COVID, a lot of exercises were cancelled, including, including Bolt Ops, which I showed you earlier. But one exercise that was not cancelled was uh, essentially a freedom of navigation mission into the Barents Sea. So the Barents Sea is beyond the Bear Gap, off Russian coastline, international waters, but off Russia, beyond Norway, Sweden, in the Barents Sea. That's how far east you've gone. And there was a UK-led group, NATO group, it enters the Barents Sea for the first time since the 1980s. It's freedom navigation, there's some espionage going on. You can see it's very closely watched by Russia. So it was, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot going on apart from each side watching each other. So not, not a particularly sophisticated military ex exercise, but diplomatic, a, re a, real, a real signal. Like NATO is back, it's gonna operate in the Barents Sea. It's gonna assert freedom of navigation in the Barents Sea uh, as it used to in the Cold War. Again, remember that, creates opportunities for the West, but also 
risks of collisions and accidental confrontations, right? Okay. Okay, let me stop there. Um, I will stop sharing and take your questions. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, I have a question real quick, uh, doctor. Um, thank you for the lecture today. Uh, going back to Sweden, you said it's entirely possible that uh, within a year's time, they could actually formally join NATO. So what would be the next signpost to look for if things were to keep heading in that direction? Uh, right, so that where they could, just to be clear, they would petition to join NATO, uh, to join NATO. that might take years to actually execute. Uh, so, so that the so membership might not, not be active next year. Depends how, how keen Sweden is. Sweden has been accelerating its, um, its defense, defense ramp up. Um, so it may be keen enough to, 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 to do it quicker than that. Um, but yes, it could petition as soon as, as, soon as next year. Uh, I think that I'm not an expert on Swedish domestic politics, but the parliamentary majority in favor of joining NATO, it needs to be confirmed by another general election, I think, before the coalition government would actually petition. Uh -huh. and, and I don't know when that uh, general election is due. But, um, but that's what I would look for, um, you know, on, in, in betting terms, if the same coalition wins that next general election, you can bet that they will petition, they will petition to join NATO. Um, having said that, there might be, they might go through the nicety of calling a referendum uh -huh. to confirm that, because going from neutrality to NATO is quite a big step. You might want to confirm that by referendum. Uh -huh. Not just uh, not just not just the political legitimacy of a general election majority, right? Sure. So so yeah. Uh, let's, so so stay tuned for the general election. See what happens then. Understood. I had a question as well. Sure. Uh, thank you again for the the lecture today. Um, I was just wondering, um, you're talking about the buildup of uh, Russian bases in the Arctic. And I remember a couple of years ago, the Trump administration was talking about buying Greenland. I'm not sure how serious that was or like if it was a lot of political, um, just it was just mostly a political movement or a political statement. Um, do you think that it's actually a, a serious asset that the United States should be looking at? Uh, oh. In naval terms, yes. So, uh, so, so th th there is a background, it's a longer background to, to why Greenland, why you would offer to buy Greenland, right? Greenland had, um, Greenland essentially went bankrupt in the 2008 financial crash. It was very exposed on the international markets and that was the government's fault. And there was a horrendous financial crisis in Greenland particularly Greenland's not a very diversified economy, right? So, so Greenland, the government was was uh, desperate to find cash. So there was actually talk uh, as soon as 2008 that Greenland might have to sell territory back to Denmark or put it on the open market. I mean, Greece was talking the same, same, same sort of initiatives. Maybe it, should, it could sell islands to make money. Um, so that's that's the lo that's the longer term economic context to, to to what Trump was reviving. So Trump was reviving uh, somewhat mischievously, I think, that proposal. Uh, realistically, what the United States government could do under any president is uh, propose to lease naval bases in Greenland, and that would be very advantageous to the United States and NATO as a whole because dealing with the Scandinavian countries can be quite um, uncertain even when you're dealing with NATO members because their their politics, their domestic politics tends to lean towards neutrality even when they're members of NATO like, NATO, like uh, Denmark, Norway. So increased 
military presence from other NATO members can get these domestic pushbacks in very small populations. So Norway's population is below six million. Um, and it's in the it's, it's, it's in the few millions. It's very small population. So big, um, big diplomatic events can get riled up, can really rile up the, the, the electorate and you can have big changes of, of, of political mood. So, uh, so the United States Marine Corps doesn't like to be overexposed in Norway in the sense it doesn't want to be dependent on Norwegian bases. So now it has a permanent base in Norway. What if they start to get the sort of pushback that they get in Japan sometimes locally, like in o Okinawa, uh, permanent bases anywhere, US permanent bases anywhere, anywhere they get pushback. Um, so it would help the United States government if it had bases off the Arctic Sea in other countries like Greenland. Uh, and, and, and it could propose to do that by lease, I would think. The, the issue is gonna be domestic politics, whether um, the people of Greenland can politically tolerate a permanent US military presence. Uh, you know, that would be, that, that's a bigger deal for, for those populations than it might intuitively seem from over here. It's like, you know, they care about deterring Russia. What, why would they balk at having US help? Well, you know, there are, it, it, it just, for, for small populations um, that, that have more neutral his, historical traditions that are more about neutrality than alliance, it, it's a bigger deal for them than it would seem to us from 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 the from living in the West, where you know alliances are 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 a routine part of our our defense and 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 in fact the defense of the whole Western Hemisphere. Um, so it'd be it'd be domestic politics. I, I think um, you know, but Biden, Biden is not focused on the northern flank. He might be later. He's four months in, so so uh, he. You know, may just not have got round to it yet. I, he he's focused on on Asia Pacific and and Russia, but but not in the northern flank. He's you know, it, actually it's difficult to know where Biden is focused when he's focused on Russia. It's sort of cyber, but not even cyber. As as you saw with the colonial pipeline thing, he's he's not he's not going to he's not blaming Russia for that, even though private experts are. So, so Biden said nothing about northern flank. There's, the, the Biden administration has no policy on the northern flank. I should have mentioned that earlier. Biden administration has no policy on the northern flank. Um, uh, so, so if it if and when it does, uh, I would expect U.S. diplomats uh, to be thinking, yeah, do they want some sort of enhanced uh, military presence in Greenland? That would be. That would be, from a purely military perspective, that would be very, very useful. Yeah. Uh, I, I also have a question, if that's all right. Sure. So in relation to sort of the UK-US relationship on the northern flank, um, you know, as you mentioned, the UK is, is looking to kind of step up its participation sort of as the, the US Marines have, have shifted back towards East Asia. Um, which is sort of an interesting kind of dichotomy as, you know, the, uh, you know, big news, uh, British carrier group is going to East Asia. They're going to do that. Uh, is, I think it's freedom of navigation mostly, uh, which yeah. is really big news. It's the first time they've done that in, in a number of years. Um, and, you know, as the U.S. Marines lose their tanks, the U.K. is gaining the Challenger 3. And that's big news. That was in the news recently, I believe, that upgrade. Um, so is the U.K. looking to sort of have like a, a strategic defense resurgence. I, I feel like I've been seeing the UK in defense news a lot more recently. Is that is that sort of something to look forward to the UK kind of getting back in the post Brexit swing of defense, you know, relationships? Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, yeah, so, so what you've seen in the news is uh, Britain completed its strategic integrated strategic and defense review, which was uh, many years overdue. Um, it was supposed to have 
been delivered in 2019, then 2020, and then it was delivered just in uh, March of this year. And what was um, what was surprising to a lot of people was how explicit it was that Russia is the greatest threat. Britain was going to focus on deterring Russia. Uh, yes, it was concerned about China, but but it has to deter Russia first. In the long term, it will worry about China as a priority, but for now it has to focus on Russia. That was very explicit. Um, what the review was uh, disappointing on was it was not, uh, it did not specify its military responses to Russia. So it did not um, promise to deploy X forces in Norway or to enhance X activities in the Barents Sea or the North Sea or anything like that. So, so in, in operational terms, we don't know anything more about what the British government plans to do on the Northern flank. As I mentioned earlier, historically, Britain has always led the Northern flank. It's led the maritime and the amphibious uh, and the air defense operations on the Northern flank. So it has this historical, you might think of it as a tradition. It can't, drop that tradition easily it uh, and and since it's now said russia is the greatest threat it it as a country wants to deal with um you know how can it possibly drop leadership of the north leadership of the northern flank uh and claim that it's focused on russia so we can expect britain to enhance its activities on the northern flank we just don't it it has not specified what it's actually going to do yet to enhance those activities. So um, yeah, I mean, watch this space. Uh, the, the British government under Boris Johnson moves incredibly slowly, even on things like Brexit. Uh, so don't expect any news on, on the Northern flank this year. Uh, you know, the best we can hope for in 2020, we get 2022, we get clarity from either Biden or Johnson on the Northern flank, but, but you can bet that they've got to enhance their military capacity on the northern flank. We just don't know what that's going to look like exactly. I mean, I should know, as you've noted in your question, they're also trying to increase their activities in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region, which doesn't leave a lot of room because both countries are are struggling economically and they feel overcommitted and they don't have a domestic um, electoral. Uh, 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 they don't have the popular opinion behind more military interventions. In fact, popular opinion, both countries wants to draw down. So, so they have domestic political constraints on how far and economic constraints on how far they can increase their military operations. So, you know, <laughs> they've got to increase it. They've said so. They've got to, they've got to deter Russia better. But with what resources, we just don't know yet.